Dr. Thompson is currently at the University of Southern California. He's the head of Enigma. Um, just a, a brief note, he has over 1,500 uh, uh, publications on Scopus with an H index over 139, which is truly impressive. Uh, he has been collaborating and still is collaborating with Quebec researchers, including 2014 William Final lecturer, Alan Evans, who I saw was online. So hello, Alan. Alan, I hope you're doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Thompson visited McGill and the University of Montreal in the 90s, uh, workshops and events organized by researchers, most of the MNI, including Alan Evans, Bruce Spike, Brenda Milner, and Keith Worsley. And uh, he confided to me that he was impressed by uh, the, the, the the way Quebec researchers were integrating mathematics, mathematics in, uh, into neuroimaging and neuroscience. And this has shaped part of his research and his career as a researcher. He describes himself as a mathematician who found a home in neuroscience and neuroimaging. So without further ado, Professor Thompson, thank you very much for accepting to present the 2021 William Feindel Lecture. Well, thank you so much, Martin. It is really kind of you. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks to Estrid and all of the organizers for doing such a wonderful uh, event. And um, also thanks again for uh, the invitation. It's a huge honor to um, present this lecture. Um, it's in honor of William Feindel, who, as you know, is a pioneering neurosurgeon who transformed the lives of many, many uh, patients uh, throughout the world with his neurosurgical techniques. And um, I read had brought uh, neuroimaging, including PET, to Canada, and, and so many pioneering discoveries. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge honor. Um, and I just want to say, just a personal note: um, you know, all of the Quebec neuroimagers who I've met, um, even from the early '90s. I mean, Martin, you mentioned uh, Alan and Keith Worsley. I mean, it, it, it's been such an inspiring experience. I mean, you can imagine as a graduate student coming to hear, you know, brilliant mathematicians and images, and you know, the these are the people that really brought the brain mapping field together and made it possible through stereotaxic mapping, I mean, much like the neurosurgeons, to uh, integrate data from many, many centers. So we'll build on that theme uh, today. Um, thanks again and congrats to the prize winners and uh, to all of those of you who have presented to each other and are helping to inspire each other, uh, even in these slightly uh, unusual times. So hoping we all get to meet each other uh, soon. So I'm going to speak for a little under 45 minutes. Um, on the topic of big data and the human brain, um, a little bit about imaging and genomics of brain diseases. Um, and this is a project called Enigma that's uh, examining brain imaging data from 100,000 individuals across 45 uh, countries. So I'll tell you a little bit about how that, uh, how that works. So all of you are familiar as neuroimagers with the variety of techniques for mapping the human brain. So there's approaches to examine brain structure and anatomy, uh, MRI, and in the past, uh, computer tomography. Uh, molecular mapping techniques with radio tracers such as PET and SPECT, um, obviously variants of uh, magnetic resonance imaging, looking at uh, uh, blood flow or related contrasts, or even molecular markers with, with MRS, and even the sort of fine scale millisecond resolution that you get from uh, EEG and optical intrinsic signal imaging. Now, many of you know that there's often a gulf between that type of data and molecular markers that are collected clinically or in uh, histologic uh, settings. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the link between our genetic code and molecular variation uh, and variations in images. So many of you are familiar with biobanks. So a little over 10 years ago, Enigma began to publish the largest neuroimaging studies of 12 brain disorders. Um, the overall goal of the project as a consortium is to discover factors that are helpful or harmful to the brain. And this has led overall to an analysis of brain scans and genomic data from a little over 100,000 people from 45 countries. This data was collected at uh, around 500 medical centers. And the way the work's organized is that a little over 2,000 scientists in different working groups uh, have been publishing on Parkinson's, epilepsy in uh, psychiatry, bipolar, major depression, schizophrenia in development, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, ADHD, and autism spectrum disorder. I'll, I'll cover a little bit about um, some of the major findings and challenges in, in doing this type of study. So Enigma, has two main goals. Uh, the first one is to try and understand how 33 major disorders of the brain affect the brain, uh, as seen with MRI, diffusion, tensor imaging, and uh, fMRI, EG, and MEG. But also a little bit more of a challenging question, which is 
how does genetic variation affect the brain? I mean, we're all different. We all have differences in our genetic code. And we screen millions of markers across the genome. Uh, some of these are called genome-wide association studies to find markers and other factors. They may be factors in the environment as well that affect brain development and aging or your risk for disease, or for that matter, your response or likely to response to, to different treatments. So there's three reasons why big data is helpful uh, for answering these questions. Uh, one is the sheer statistical power uh, to tackle new kinds of questions. So cracking the brain's genetic code uh, has been impossible to solve before without a large amount of data. A lot of efficiency comes from being able to use uh, massive distributed computing uh, across many, many countries. Um, we'll talk about some new mathematics, uh, cooperative machine learning, uh, deep learning that, that are being brought to bear on brain images. And then also the team science. So, I mean, as you all know, in, in this meeting, you know, we're learning from each other. And even if someone had all the data in the world, they wouldn't necessarily have all the insights. So there's a sort of collective intelligence and just share you know, the enjoyment of working with other neuroscientists on these, these problems. Now, there are three or four different challenges with linking genetic and brain imaging data. There's a very large search space. So you might want to search whole genome sequences, uh, which are 3 billion nucleotides for variants that affect the brain. You might have, you know, eventually a million subjects that, where you have to prioritize computations or reduce the dimension of data. The data is multi-site. Uh, you might be computing on different servers around the world. Um, and not all the sites yield identical data. I mean, there are scanner biases or site effects depending on how you collected it. Um, not all sites scan people who are identical. I mean, there's people from different countries and obviously patients with different uh, disorders. So we'll talk about some of the mathematics that is being developed to uh, help integrate that data. So here's where the data is. Um, it doesn't sit at any one site. In fact, that would be very uh, impractical to transfer this data around, particularly genetic data. The colors are the disorder or disease that the center studies the most. And so there's psychiatric, neurological, and developmental disorders here. And you can see from you know, North America to Europe, to the Far East, to, to Africa, there are many centers collecting brain images um, of patients with different disorders. So if you want a quick review, uh, there's a QR code that'll send you to a paper that talks about uh, the, the overall goals of, of, of this activity. Um, the effort is divided into work on different clinical uh, conditions. So many of you working in neuroimaging and psychiatry will know that schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depression uh, share some uh, similarities clinically and also in terms of their brain correlates and also some differences. But then there are many related and comorbid disorders. There's early onset psychosis, which may be a little bit different, uh, schizotypy, which is a normal uh, uh, spectrum condition. People who are at high risk for these conditions may have uh, initial signs of, of the illness. And then you'll see grouped together many neurological disorders where there is a brain imaging correlate that's agreed and accepted, but we're very interested in how that varies and how it's modulated by treatment or genomic uh, variation. And of course, none of these conditions is a uniform thing. So a brain injury, for example, can be uh, incurred in the military or through sports or um, e even very sadly through intimate partner violence. These present very differently uh, clinically and uh, for neuroimaging. And so there are specialized working groups that uh, work on each of these topics. And not, not to mention the vast variety of neuroimaging methods that can be used and also genetic analysis methods that are seen here. And there are special subgroups dedicated to testing and developing methods uh, to look at these different uh, features. Here's the overall picture. You'll see um, working groups using neuroimaging and mathematics to study uh, these different clinical conditions. Also, it's very important to look at um, lifespan, uh, normal aging or healthy aging. And there are many, many sex differences or even gender differences in the way that the um, clinical conditions present and also the neurobiology. Uh, this is all led by people all around the world. Here are, here are some of them. Um, I just want to say a little bit about the growth of collaboration. So from early work uh, by Ellen Evans and colleagues at, at McGill in the 90s, People began to collaborate and share data all over the world. You might have uh, the little dots here are, are labs or people, the little lines are, are collaborations between them. And you might be able to share data or pull it with people from other uh, labs around the world. Um, these little clusters might be scientists analyzing a certain disease with MRI, diffusion tensor imaging or functional imaging. But you can imagine another disease could be studied with the exact same methods and processing techniques and you could build or see organically evolve a modular hierarchical network in which 
people can um, cooperate uh, across conditions and share information about what they're finding from different diseases. So this led uh, to the largest neuroimaging studies. This is uh, structural uh, brain imaging uh, of nine different uh, disorders. You'll see major depression, bipolar and schizophrenia. These are maps of gray matter uh, um, deficits or gray matter reductions in each of the conditions. Uh, you'll see that some of them uh, are associated with you know, very broad differences in, in uh, brain structure. Um, epilepsy, for example, schizophrenia, for example. Others much more subtle. And in fact, autism spectrum disorder um, is associated in general with, it. in fact, a, a, an extra amount of gray matter. And we'll talk about this in, uh, in, in detail. Uh, and, and you can get the T-shirt. So this is, if you want to wear your data, you can also buy a, a T-shirt or I'll send you one for free. So let me just set the stage a little bit. So for many, many years, and, and again, starting at, at the Montreal Neurological Institute, uh, Texas, London, and, and UCLA uh, in the 90s, people were collecting uh, neuroimaging data from populations and measuring um, the, even just the size or volume of parts of the brain to develop normative uh, information uh, on the trajectory of brain structure across the lifespan. Now, why would you do this? Well, you could develop statistical confidence limits uh, on the values for these uh, brain metrics. And then if a patient comes in and you want to gauge the degree of abnormality, you can use a reference that is um, adapted to their age, uh, their, their sex, and, and other factors that might affect uh, brain morphometry. Now, if you uh, compute, in this case, the size of the left hippocampus, the brain's major memory system, and you plot its volume across age, and you put together data from different centers, different centers are in color, you will see that the, you know, different centers scan people of different age ranges. You can sort of build together a quilt or a patchwork of the uh, changes that you see. And there are methods such as hierarchical Bayes uh, modeling that would enable you to build a lifespan trajectory uh, for these different structures. These are now based on uh, tens of thousands of people uh, in the early 90s and 20 years ago. You know, we were lucky if we had 100 people to, to base these on. But um, you'll see that for each of the major subcortical structures, the trajectory of rapid growth until they're about 20, uh, some structures remain stable in their volume uh, for the greater part of life throughout uh, you know, middle age to age 60 or so. And then there's a more precipitous uh, decline. For example, here you see hippocampal volume de decline very precipitously. Uh, after age 60. So you could look at this, you could say, well, you know, this is a reference. Uh, here, here's uh, brain data based on um, women who've been scanned with MRI and have a sort of chart uh, like in pediatrics uh, where you could see where you are or whether you know, you're improving or declining relative to the uh, available statistical norms. And the problem is we'd really like to understand what are the factors that affect uh, in the first instance, these volumes and eventually function and connectivity and other, other things. And in psychiatric genetics, they had found that this may require uh, DNA from upwards of 50,000 people um, for a couple of reasons. First, the effects are subtle and hard to find and you have to gather enough evidence. Uh, and then secondly, um, it was, was thought that maybe brain biomarkers might make this more efficient. So rather than try and identify genomic markers that are linked to Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia, maybe as brain mappers we could find genetic uh, variation that uh, is associated with um, you know, the activity of the temporal lobe or glucose metabolism or some other molecular marker we could uh, examine with imaging. Now, there were some skeptics. So Nick Martin, who is the president of the Behavioral Genetics Association said, you know, I don't think it'll be any more efficient uh, to find genetic markers that affect the brain than anything else, just because images are more um, expensive to collect than measures of height or weight. It doesn't change the power calculation. So he is a very sweet and kind person. He's one of the most highly published geneticists, uh, in fact, the most highly published geneticist in the Southern Hemisphere. And Nick Martin uh, really said, you know, this endophenotype theory that if you have uh, brain measures that are perhaps closer to uh, the genetic uh, code, it maybe doesn't make any difference. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. So this is a study in nature where people around the world measured the volume uh, using automatic software of subcortical structures on MRI. And they asked the question, are there any variants in the genome, any uh, single nucleotide uh, or single letter changes in the genome that affect the volumes of these structures? And I'll explain these different maps for different structures in a minute, but there, there, there are. And um, the way you do it is um, you go through the genetic code um, at each letter, and there are 3 billion of them, 
Um, everyone has a certain letter. It could be A or C or T or, 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 or G. And then you run a statistical regression adjusting for other factors, maybe the age and sex of the person and, and some components related to their uh, ancestry. And you ask if there's any evidence that that uh, genetic variant is linked uh, to anything in the brain. It could be the size of the brain or it could be its function. Now, just an example, if you do this in patients with, for example, Alzheimer's disease, you will find that patients with Alzheimer's disease on average have more um, instances of certain genetic letters or certain genetic nucleotides. The most famous is um, the common variant in the APOE or apolipoprotein E uh, gene, where a quarter of us have a, a, a variant that uh, triples our risk for Alzheimer's disease. And so obviously these are very important for our health and there's a quest to understand, you know, how to counteract them and first of all, where they, where they are. Now, is it useful? So you could um, look at your genetic markers, um, even today, the ones that are associated with Alzheimer's disease, and you can add them all up in a way that's proportional to the risk they give you for Alzheimer's disease. This is called the polygenic risk score. And you could look at um, people at different quantiles of polygenic risk across the lifespan and how, how um, much Alzheimer's disease they get. In other words, in any given year, what is the percent incidence of Alzheimer's disease? And that's on the y-axis here. And you can see there's an absolutely remarkable variation uh, between you know, people in the top 1% uh, of risk. Uh, this is just coming from the genetic code that you're born with uh, and people that uh, are, are at lower risk. And I mean, very, very important for neuroscientists and clinicians to understand this and uh, partner with drug companies to, to, to counteract it. Now the case in mental illness is often more complicated. So you can do this uh, in, for example, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder you'll find a much more polygenic architecture. I mean, rather than those discrete peaks in the genome that confer a great deal of risk, um, here people have discovered, um, actually since 2009, now over, I think, 200 genetic loci, some in the immune uh, genes that are involved in the immune system, others uh, are polymorphisms in subunits of the dopamine receptor, which has been long implicated in schizophrenia and psychosis. Um, and you, you can imagine that as you add more data, I mean, I should explain what's going on in these plots. The x-axis is your genome, uh, the little uh, colored towers of the uh, chromosomes. And what we're showing here on the y-axis is the evidence that uh, in this case, those genetic variants are linked with schizophrenia. And the reason it's growing is that on the y-axis, we show the native log base 10 of, of the statistical significance of association between that genetic marker uh, and in this case, um, the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And what, once you have, in this case, 30,000 people, you have a huge number of genetic loci that um, are not only predictive of schizophrenia, but collectively uh, can help predict your lifetime risk. And so the molecular basis is, is, is of great interest. Now, what does Enigma do? So Enigma sort of borrows this method um, and we compute brain measures from different types of scan. Uh, anatomical MRI allows you to look at morphometry, very nice software. Um, uh, McGill, Louis Collins, uh, and Alan Evans uh, developed animal seg segmentation technique that was also, um, you know, the other, other methods such as FreeSurfer developed by Bruce Fischel and Anders Dale at MGH, allow the entire brain mapping community around the world uh, to compute volumes for their patients and healthy controls. Uh, diffusion imaging, uh, FSL, which is a software tool uh, developed by Steve Smith and colleagues in Oxford, that will let you evaluate the microstructure of the brain's white matter. And you could collect all this data up and test associations between these brain measures and over a million markers in the genome. There's a few details uh, involved in quality control and actually imputing genetic data. Many people are genotyped using different molecular arrays and there's some business of making sure that the nucleotides that, that are examined are the same. But then you can meta-analyze the data. So there's a key concept here. Um, if you have an election, uh, let's say there's an election for the US president, for example, you weight the vote uh, coming from each US state, and I'm sure it's the same uh, in, in, in other parts of the world, so that the vote uh, of each uh, in imaging, it would be lab, depends on the sample size that they have. And this makes sure that you can boost the power to pick up effects that no site could pick up on its own. Uh, and the principle of meta-analysis is a good one anyway. Uh, you can verify whether the effects are ever found again, and if they're found in different uh, ethnic groups or people with different uh, demographics or risk factors. Now, if you look at uh, the human hippocampus, this is a surface model of it. There are markers in the genome. Uh, this is a marker in the Harakiri gene. Uh, 
um, that affect its volume. And because as brain mappers, we like mapping statistical effects, you can see exactly where the effect is. Um, that tower in black there is a um, variant in a gene, um, very common variant, uh, about half of us uh, ha have this variant. And the people that carry the adverse variant have, uh, on average, uh, hippocampal volume uh, reductions, not to the point that it would lead to a disorder, but it's sort of interesting that this is a normal variation. Um, we had a telephone call from Kazim Abulaeva, who's a geneticist in Dagestan, uh, a Russian geneticist, saying that she had been genotyping um, ethnic isolates, so people in these highland communities of the Caucas Caucasus Mountains, and through linkage analysis, uh, she'd found the same genetic marker that is associated in the general population with hippocampal volume reduction has deletions in uh, the Caucasus populations that are associated with mental retardation and also with, with psychosis. It's very interesting serendipity where she implicated the same part of the genome uh, in having you know, an effect on very serious mental illness uh, in some people when it's deleted. But just these single letter changes uh, seem to be associated with um, variations in the normal range for hippocampal volume. So this was um, the first study. Um, six loci in the genome found that are associated with hippocampal volume. This required about 30,000 people. Um, you can look at the genes we talked about. So we mentioned that Alzheimer's disease, um, you, you know, your risk for it depends on your genotype. You could look at, for example, the APOE4 gene and say, the people that carry the Alzheimer's conferring variant uh, have a lower hippocampal volume. I mean, hippocampal volume is very important uh, for memory and in Alzheimer's it's uh, depleted. Um, and the graph on the right shows that in 60 worldwide populations, um, the people that carry the APOE4, um, a quarter of us carry this uh, genotype that triples your risk for Alzheimer's, have a gradual shift in hippocampal volume away from everyone else uh, that eventually reaches two standard deviations from uh, the reference um, by the time that you're in your 70s. And this could be one of several mechanisms whereby this variant uh, is associated with greater uh, Alzheimer's risk. So encouraged by this, um, this carried on, people measured hippocampal volume, found six genetic loci that affect it, intracranial volume, which is the size of the brain, or a measure of the size of the brain, seven hits that are associated with it. Some of the, the genes are famous. So MAP-T, um, variants in that gene, uh, it's a tau-related gene, are associated with uh, Parkinson's disease. So it's interesting that, um, actually rather ironic, that the people that carry a Parkinson's risk uh, variant in, in, in MAP-T tend to have larger brain volume uh, early in life. It's a very, very interesting observation, maybe some antagonistic pleiotropy related to that, that gene. Of course, tau is involved in every uh, neuron of the brain. It's a basic cellular uh, scaffolding. And really by sort of comparing, I mean, this is a Parkinson's genetic screen, the markers that come up, uh, you know, the variants that matter for Parkinson's disease tend to be in synuclein alpha, which is a synaptic vesicle uh, release gene. It releases dopamine, which is very important in Parkinson's, and also MAP-T, which is a major component of brain cells. You could line up the ones that affect brain imaging measures with the ones that affect disease risk and begin to understand why these markers affect disease risk, because you have something in the brain that you can point to that might be mechanistically possible to study. So this Firework display uh, it shows all of the genetic markers now known to be related to the size of different subcortical structures. Um, it's truly remarkable. So th this is the latest update. Uh, Miguel Renteria, Adrian Campos, and Sarah Medlin in Brisbane um, found that just by looking at univariate associations between genetic markers and volumes of these very important parts of the basal ganglia and the hippocampus, um, you could essentially predict uh, a person's um, brain volume, or at least account for uh, four or five percent of the variation, um, doesn't work so well um, if you estimate this based on people of uh, white Caucasian ancestry. Um, the, the genes are a little bit different in people of different ancestry, and so there needs to be more uh, diverse studies done. But it, it's truly remarkable. I mean, this is uh, predicting brain volumes in a data set that was not used. Uh, to find the variants. Uh, in fact, the data set here is ABCD, which uh, Alan Evans and others are very familiar with. It's a, a North American study to study uh, brain development in children. And much of the variation, or at least five, four to five percent in brain volume, can be completely predicted from the genetic code uh, 
that a person has when they're born, which is quite quite interesting. Now, Nick Martin said, um, you know, you'll need a lot of brain images to find these variants. Um, and he also said that um, brain imaging is not any more efficient than anything else uh, for finding uh, genetic variants, or at least that's a default hypothesis. That isn't true. And so Dominic Holland, uh, Anders Dale and others, uh, and also Jason Stein uh, and Nina Matoba more recently, have plotted the number of people that you need to scan or examine to find a certain fraction of the genetic uh, variants associated with different traits. And it does seem if you plot these that brain imaging biomarkers um, need fewer people to find the cause, the, the genetic variants. And why, why is this? Well, you know, things like major depression, so that's the worst one, uh, is affected by so many things other than genetics. And even the genetic markers that are influential in depression are spread all over the genome and there's no one single variant that has a big effect. Whereas for HDL, um, high density uh, liver protein, there are markers that are very uh, tightly linked with the values of it. And so volumes of parts of the brain are somewhere in between. Uh, disorders sort themselves out from neurology, tending to have a more efficient genetic architecture to discover than, than psychiatry. And just to explain this graph, the x-axis is the number of people you need uh, to find genetic variants. Uh, number six means you need a million because you've done log base 10. Number seven mean, means you need 10 million. Um, and, and the proportion of genetic variants explained is on the y-axis. So some traits and brain measures are more efficient, which it is very useful to do in the beginning to plan how many uh, collaborators or data sets you need to collect. Now, what is the genetic architecture of, uh, for example, the cerebral cortex? You can steer around different areas here, the precentral uh, gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. And there's partially overlapping and partially distinct genetic variants associated with, in this case, the surface area uh, of these. Um, this paper in Science uh, a year ago was a monumental collaboration where people pulled brain imaging data from around the world uh, and, and tested uh, genetic associations. You'll see that um, remarkably, this is a map of the genome, much of the genome is implicated in influencing brain morphology um, around, of the, uh, around the, uh, um, a quarter of the variation in the total surface area of the brain can be accounted for uh, by, by, by these markers. And there are hotspots, there are certain genetic regions where variants have a, a much bigger effect uh, than elsewhere and we're just beginning to understand why. Here's some famous parts of the brain and here's the loci that seem to uh, affect them. And you can do a sort of 3D Manhattan plot. This is called a Manhattan plot because the skyscrapers in Manhattan look a bit like this. Um, the different colors are different brain regions. Uh, the uh, One of the x-axis, I don't know what we'd call that, um, the chromosomes uh, are listed on one side. And there isn't a huge amount of overlap between the loci that affect one part of the brain and the other. You can do genetic clustering to see, and there are um, genetic modules, so to speak. Um, the way this is done is looking at uh, something called genetic correlation. So much as we'd look with uh, resting state functional imaging at uh, correlations in the time series of functional activation, you can look at correlations between the Manhattan plots, the um, genetic blueprints of the different areas, and when they overlap, you can cluster them and label them as clusters. And this is beginning to lend some insight into the basic uh, genetic geography of the brain, which doesn't always follow, uh, as you might imagine, the way we parcelate it today. Now, I, I alluded to this earlier that some of the variants that affect brain structure also overlap with ones associated with risk for um, Parkinson's disease, major depression, ADHD, and insomnia. And this, this is very interesting because you can start to home in on regions where these loci might shift uh, the architecture of the brain and see how that relates to clinical presentation or outcomes in people uh, with these conditions. Now you can look at all this, it's all in a browser. Uh, you could look up your favorite gene or brain region, look at the uh, latest discoveries for genetic associations. Um, I do want to say that that's only one type of genetic variation. So these single nucleotide changes that we all have, I mean, they're mainly not harmful are very different than the deletions uh, or duplications that are found uh, in several major disorders of the brain. So you, many of you are familiar with Fragile X syndrome, Williams syndrome, Turner syndrome, which result from deletions of genetic material, or for that matter, Huntington's disease, which is a very serious neurological disorder, 
that results from duplication, a sort of abnormal uh, proliferation of CAG nucleotide uh, repeats in the genome. So Ida Solovey and colleagues founded uh, Enigma CNV where they looked for abnormal deletions uh, or rare duplications in the genome uh, all over the world. They aggregated data and some of these deletions um, don't have any noticeable clinical effect, but they increase a person's risk for mental health uh, conditions such as schizophrenia or developmental conditions such as autism. And what's interesting is that in this case, um, people carrying these deletions at different chromosomal regions are contrasted uh, for surface area, regional surface area and regional cortical thickness with the red colors being more uh, stronger differences. It's interesting to see if the people who go on to develop um, psychosis or uh, autism spectrum disorders differ from those who do not when you carry these deletions. They're not completely penetrant in the sense that not everyone with these deletions gets the illness. And what we're finding, which is remarkable, and this is partly based on work by Sébastien Jacquemont and Clara Moreau uh, working in, in Montreal uh, with, with Pierre Bellec, who many of you will know, um, there are subtypes within these genetic deletions that tend to be associated with a much higher or lower risk. Uh, so obviously it's not all genetics, there are other factors that influence whether you'll develop these different conditions. And you could imagine, and this is I think a, a, a goal for Seb Jacquemont uh, and, and colleagues, uh, to have a sort of dictionary of genetic disorders in which we look at our favorite structures of the brain and look at the, uh, first of all, correlates of the genetic uh, change and then beyond that, what factors might uh, resist or modulate uh, the risk uh, for different psychiatric and developmental uh, conditions. And here's Ida Sonderby, who leads Enigma CNV, uh, presenting at a meeting it's a little over two years ago in Anaheim, uh, the growing dictionary of genetic variants. Um, and I, I would add that you know, the collective pooling of data from scientists around the world that work on neurogenetics was absolutely critical for this because it's so rare. I mean, some of these variants happen in one in 2,000 or one in uh, 4,000 uh, people. So any one scientist trying to recruit uh, enough individuals would, would, would face great difficulty. Now, I haven't talked about brain function at all. And so one of the, um, in fact, the, the, the pioneering work of William Feindel, who this lecture is on, in honor of, of uh, was using EEG uh, uh, electroencephalography to record uh, in his case, uh, the areas of cortical regions and, and their uh, activity prior to surgical resection. This can be done uh, outside the scalp, outside of neurosurgery. This is me getting an EEG. And as many of you know, you can reconstruct the um, neuronal activity under certain assumptions using inverse uh, uh, problem formulations. But you can do genetics on the signal. So you can look at the, for example, um, power spectra coming from EEG, which are related to uh, different behaviors and they're altered in various neurological conditions and you can ask are there genetic loci that affect uh, these and Dirk Smit leading Enigma EEG um, pulled together uh, people with genetic and EEG data from around the world to see if there are loci that are related to oscillatory brain activity and he he found that a variant in the GABA2 gene so there's a gene uh, that is involved in the GABA pathway the principal uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain a variant uh, in, in, in one of the genes uh, involved in GABA neurotransmission uh, affects beta power in the brain. This is the description of the oscillatory activity in the brain in the uh, approximately 20 hertz frequency band. Now, this was a genetic marker that had already been associated with alcoholism, epilepsy, but it wasn't clear why. So you can imagine that um, genomic markers that affect the functional synchrony of the brain, this is just the beginning, obviously, of studies uh, that look at this, might overlap with psychiatric uh, and neurological disease risk low sign where we may begin to find some mechanistic insight uh, into this. Now you could say, well, you know, the risk for illness isn't all set in stone at birth. I mean, your genetic code is inherited and doesn't change except for somatic mutations as you get older. But there is epigenetic modification. So there is methylation and a number of other processes that modify whether or not genes are uh, expressed and to what degree. And you can actually do a similar thing uh, to a genome-wide screen with uh, methylation. You would say, is there anywhere in the genome where the level of methylation is linked to, for example, hippocampal volume or some other brain trait that we care about? Uh, and there is. So this, this is work by uh, Tian Yejia and Sylvain de Rivière in uh, 
in London, uh, where they uh, pulled together data from 11 cohorts with uh, methylation assays, epigenetic assays, and found that there are two sites, very promising sites that need replication, where the level of methylation of the genome is linked uh, with hippocampal volume. And you can imagine, because methylation and epigenetic age uh, is a topic of great interest for mortality, all-cause mortality, uh, epigenetics is very important in, in, in cancer and post-traumatic stress syndrome. This epigenomic analysis of the brain is sort of a very a field with great potential to understand why uh, these modifications uh, affect uh, disease risk, uh, oft, often neoplastic disease risk, such as cancer, but also psychiatric illness, such as post-traumatic uh, stress. Now you say, well, okay, you've told me, Paul, about genes that affect how my brain looks, but I don't care about them because I can have a scan anyway. Is there anything you could predict about how speedily my brain is going to age? And so you could, as was done here, collect longitudinal data. Um, here, Rachel Brown, Hilke Holshoff, Paul in, in Utrecht, uh, aggregated data from 37 worldwide cohorts where people had been scanned uh, more than once with MRI. So you could estimate the speed or rate uh, of growth and development or you know, loss of tissue as we age. And they, they made these charts for, they're a little funny, they're, they're maps of the speed or rate of, of uh, tissue gain or loss for different structures. It's sort, of, it's sort of the derivative of the other maps we showed earlier. And they found that there are um, loci in the genome that predict the rate of uh, in childhood development uh, or aging in, in, in old age. And some of them predict this all the time, others are only predictive in uh, groups of people uh, of a certain age, I and mean, this is re really fascinating. You'd have a sort of uh, prorated score from these genes uh, to say, you know, how fast someone's going to use lose brain tissue. It's sort of interesting for pharmaceutical companies interested in uh, targets, drug genome guided uh, drug targets, to see if they can interfere with the cascade of molecular uh, changes that's induced by these genetic uh, polymorphisms. Now, another criticism you can say, well, Paul, you've used univariate statistical tests so far. I mean, we all know that the genome doesn't work one letter at a time. We know that the brain doesn't work one pixel at a time. Could you please be you're a little bit more mathematically sophisticated in how you model the effects of genetics and environment or epigenetics on the brain? So the reason Enigma was called Enigma is that in the Second World War, or at least just before it, the Germans developed an encryption machine called Enigma. It's like a typewriter. And when you press the keys on the left, uh, a code comes out. And then um, Polish and British and American scientists working at Bletchley Park uh, near Oxford, you can go and see these machines if you want to, um, developed a decoding machine where they said, well, you know, we want to understand how this encrypts or encodes uh, the signals. These were used to encrypt radio, secret radio transmissions during the war. And you, you can do something like this. So, you know, th there's work by uh, Lee Shen and Marco Lorenzi and many others that use classical multivariate uh, or bimultivariate statistics to say, tell me the best linear combination of markers uh, in the genome that explain uh, you know, the most about the brain signals. And for that matter, why don't we try and find the best linear combination or map? Uh, you could think of a weighted map in the image uh, of, of signals uh, that are affected by, by this set of genes. Because of course, the genes don't affect just one pixel, they affect uh, many as we saw through the genetic correlation maps, they affect many regions uh, uh, at the same time. Another way to go at this is not just using mathematics, it's to use bioinformatic information um, from genetic studies of other measures, you know, plasma, uh, behavior, other things, and prioritize the discovery of markers for which either uh, we know that they're expressed in the brain or that they're um, genes of interest to us, and that actually can help to guide or prioritize the search. There's many Bayesian methods that try and um, understand uh, markers in the genome that have known gene expression or no, known uh, function, and, and you can do that too. Another approach is to do voxel-wise, genome-wide search. So brain mappers like to see where um, predictors are exerting their effect. Um, problem is, if you do this with 8 million voxels and um, even just a million nucleotides, you'll get 200 terabytes of results, uh, which might take a while to look through. Um, but you can do it. And I mean, ju just to be fair, I mean, most imaging studies associate a task or um, diagnosis with differences in activation or structure at different points in the brain. 
you couldn't do this with genetic markers. The maps are pretty weak. So these cohorts that uh, individually are just under a thousand people, you'll see that it's a little bit chaotic where uh, th this was a genetic locus that um, was discovered to affect uh, putamen volume. And if you look at the brain-wide association, you can kind of see it. Uh, Avni is a North American study of elderly people. Hunt is a Norwegian study. QTIM is the Queensland twin imaging uh, study in, in Brisbane. And um, if you meta-analyze the signals, um, or in fact, the beta, the coefficients uh, from these association maps, you get a really strong hotspot with uh, 3,000 people. So that really shows you the power of meta-analysis in the context of weak predictors. I mean, it really settles down uh, if you do this type of averaging. Again, you, know, you want to pay tribute again to the Montreal group where their template, which you can see here, is being used. I and mean, all this data from around the world was aggregated by registration and alignment to the Montreal Neurological Institute uh, template that was developed uh, by Alan Evans and colleagues in the, in the 90s and refined since then. Now, okay, so you could also say, what if we um, want to cooperatively compute on this data? It's all over the world. Um, it's a little bit complicated. I'll go to this next, ne next slide. Let's say we want to do a task in images like label tumor or find an abnormality, but the data is in all sorts of different parts of the world, the different data owners. There are methods such as federated learning, uh, which in combination with deep learning, uh, deep neural nets, uh, are very, very powerful to uh, identify patterns associated with uh, genetic variation or, or disease in data that's all around the world. And this paper by Dmitry Strepolis, it's a new one on federated learning, refers to the um, goal of computing um, on remote data, aggregating at a central server um, the conclusions. Uh, Meta-analysis is the simplest way of aggregating statistical evidence. You can also do iterative computation across many, many sites. And you can see whether having access to very, very large data sets is, is beneficial uh, in, in, in training or predicting things uh, from the images, and, and, and it is. One thing that you'll find if you do this is that the data coming from different imaging uh, sites differs in its uh, statistical distribution. So there's been a lot of effort uh, in data harmonization methods from COMBAT, which is a just simple linear shift and scale of uh, brain measures to uh, make more congruent the measures that each site collects, uh, all the way through to hierarchical bays, which models a population effect and a site effect, uh, to generate adversarial networks, a very, very ingenious type of deep learning uh, that adjusts site data coming uh, for, from each site so that it's more uh, congruent before making statistical conclusions. And one really cool idea in this paper by Dan Moyer, who's a student in our group, is scanner invariant representation. So in other words, how would your brain look if you've been scanned on a different scanner? So one of the issues in pooling data internationally is that although the scanners are largely the same, uh, people do use different protocols. And wouldn't it be great if you could adjust the image such that uh, a, a scan collected in Montreal could be modified so it looks like one collected in England or Los Angeles or, or South Africa? And there are generative adversarial networks, which is a type of deep learning uh, neural network that can, uh, as shown here, encode the information in a scan to leave behind only the scanner invariant uh, information. This is uh, often called a variational autoencoder in the, in the field of deep learning. And you train it in a very interesting way. You, you say, I'm going to want you to encode the scan in such a way that an adversary, a, a neural network that is designed as an adversary, cannot tell which site this data came from. So you feed it data from all sorts of different sites collected with different protocols. And in this adversarial context, you adjust the imaging contrast of the data either um, by gradient descent, which is often used in, in deep learning, or in a principled way based on the MR physics. You can also use known MR parameters to adjust it. And in the end, you get uh, site-adjusted data, which in many contexts is more powerful for making general conclusions. Okay, so final uh, five minutes. If you're not so interested in genetics, the same principles can be applied to find patterns of abnormality in the brain that are associated with different brain disorders that are listed here. So Enigma began to aggregate uh, brain imaging data here, structural imaging data. And again, we're looking at the gray matter thickness, in this case, the thickness of the cortical gray matter. And the colors are contrasting patients with certain disorders, uh, 
relative to typical healthy people of the same age and, and sex. In these statistical maps, the color bar is, is called Cohen's D. It's a map of the amount of difference or standardized measure of the amount of difference. And you can see that for different brain conditions, um, addiction, alcohol use, uh, neurogenetic disorders, uh, autism spectrum, there are very characteristic patterns that partly overlap. Uh, there's some interesting clustering. Uh, in fact, just to point to one, um, major depression uh, is associated with very subtle uh, deficits in gray matter in the limbic system. If you look on the top right there, you'll see the singulate jump out as the area of greatest cortical difference in major depression. But people with bipolar disorder who have manic as well as depressive episodes also have deficits in the frontal cortex, in fact, greater ones. Um, it's very interesting because the frontal cortex obviously is involved in, in, in inhibition. So it's interesting to compare these. You could make a, a dictionary in a sense. Um, but I, I do want to say that, you know, many of these disorders are dynamic. So if you were to look, for example, at Parkinson's disease, and many uh, of you in Quebec, uh, Alain Daguerre and, and others, are working on Parkinson's with imaging. Uh, the, these deficits shift as the disease progresses. So, I mean, we shouldn't mislead ourselves that there's some archetype that represents how a patient looks. Um, the you know, age of onset and degree of progression affects these. And you can stratify all of the data uh, to look at patients of different uh, disease stages and characteristics to try and understand these shifting patterns and, and, and modulators. You can look at all the data I've shown in this uh, viewer. It's an online viewer called the Enigma Viewer. You can Google it. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Sarah Lariviere and Boris Panhart who developed uh, the, um, in Montreal the Enigma Toolbox. It's a way of relating um, brain maps to other sources of data, either to gene expression, which is called virtual histology, uh, or other multimodal data on uh, brain connectivity. Um, in the spirit of William Feindel's work on, on epilepsy with neurosurgery, they've been working on, uh, as part of Enigma Epilepsy, discovering hubs in the cortical network. Uh, many of you are familiar with connectomics and graph theory. Are there any hubs or network properties in epilepsy that are linked with the patterns of atrophy that you see in different epilepsy syndromes? And they've been using this toolbox that Sauer and, and, and Boris have developed uh, to link to the Montreal Big Brain data set is a tremendous resource on cellular level data to give us better uh, mechanistic understanding of the, the sort of macroscopic maps. All right, so final two minutes. Um, you can do a lot of things with brain mapping. Uh, you can look at brain connectivity with diffusion imaging. Uh, you can make extremely complicated maps using tractography. I see uh, Maxime Decoteau, who's one of my heroes, works in uh, diffusion tractography is, is, is on the line. And you can embed these maps um, in relation to topographic maps of the cortex to look at uh, maps of brain connectivity, either through anatomical methods or uh, functional synchrony uh, related methods. I just want to say all the methods that we've discussed for genetic association are applicable directly uh, to the connectome. Um, Enigma just launched a diffusion MRI GWAS, we'd love to have your um, help and, and uh, uh, advice on doing this for uh, functional and uh, connectomic data. Um, but it's, it's very interesting to think that we stand on the brink of a decade where many of these more advanced neuroimaging modalities can be used to lend insight into uh, genetic risk. Um, what did we learn? So beyond the science, um, it's been politically beneficial when projects are led from different countries. We talked about greater power more efficiency, more expertise. Uh, there are Enigma sites all across Russia and Novosibirsk, very important uh, sites collecting brain imaging data. Um, people scanning uh, children in Thailand, contributing to study, for example, infectious disease. Uh, there is an India Enigma initiative um, where people are looking at cultural factors that might affect uh, brain aging. It's very important beyond the, the genome. And also uh, groups in Asia, the Japanese consortium Kokoro, and also uh, Chinese consortia, trying uh, to relate um, largely white ancestry people's uh, data, not exclusively, but largely, to findings um, about mental illness and neurological disorders in, in, in Asian countries, and finding, at least at first pass, that the brain correlates are largely the same, which isn't entirely surprising, but it's, it's encouraging. Um, new initiatives uh, in the Middle East, uh, linking in, as we said, you know, differences in the genetic code that are characteristic of different uh, people of different ancestry. Uh, 
And um, I'll skip this in the interest of time. I just want to say, you know, if you're interested in taking part or uh, want to start a project with these different groups, um, do, do contact us. I mean, you're very welcome to join in. I mean, these projects aren't uh, um, all planned in advance. If you have some good ideas, uh, do join us and you're very welcome to work with this data. And uh, I want to acknowledge all the people here who funded it, um, all of the federal and, and private agencies around the world and all the people that contributed their time to this project. And just ending with a quote. And so um, this was written by Aristotle uh, in 350 BC. And uh, he, he, he said at the bottom there, ek panton di sunethroid zominon genestai ti megatos, which means individually we contribute little to the quest for truth, but working together the whole vast world of science is within our reach. So I just want to thank all of you. Uh, congratulations to all of you who presented. Uh, thank you to Dr. Martin Lepage, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Estra, and other people on the organizing committee for such a welcoming uh, and, and fun session. And uh, good luck to everyone, and thanks for being here today.